Hello, it's Simon Thornley. I'm an epidemiologist at the University of Auckland, and I'm going to give an epidemiologist's take on COVID-19. So, what is the threat posed by the virus? What is the evidence for lo hard lockdowns? And what do I think are the next steps? So, my initial thoughts with COVID-19 took me back to swine flu in 2009. I noticed that there was a high mortality initially from hospitalized cases. There was a clamor in public health to stamp it out. There was lots of Tamiflu being given. But eventually this was dialed back once serology tests over the whole population showed that the infection was almost ubiquitous in New Zealand about 20 to 30 percent of us had seen the virus in the past. So those were some of the initial thoughts that I had. What do we know about COVID-19? Well, it started in Wuhan, a very densely populated area uh, of China. There was a new coronavirus discovered called novel coronavirus. However, that means that it had just been discovered, not necessarily that it had, it had never been around. There was an epidemiological link to a wet market and the hospital was flooded with cases of a respiratory illness that had a typical uh, characteristic radiological pattern. What do we know about coronaviruses? Well, there's some coronaviruses have very high case fatality rates. They are nasty viruses. SARS, MERS, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Virus, is SARS and MERS are examples of a very nasty respiratory virus that causes a high proportion of deaths in people who get infected. However, there's another four viruses which cause relatively mild illness, so an influenza-like illness. So we need to think about where this virus is on that spectrum. There was initially case reports of high mortality from the virus, particularly in people affected by chronic disease, such as diabetes or cardiovascular disease. It was initially thought to be a zoonotic disease, starting in bats, then changing to pangolins or crossing a species barrier and then crossing the species barrier to humans. And the wet market story went with that. Another curious factor was men being more affected by the virus than women. So as an epidemiologist, I wanted to understand the magnitude of the threat from the virus, because this is a key element. And we know that seasonal influenza is around about 0.1%. Uh, and we use what we call an infection mortality rate to give us a guide of how severe the, the virus is. And this is initially calculated from the deaths from the disease divided by the total number of people with infection. And as in the swine flu case, this was originally very, very high since the number of people who were tested for swine flu was very small and it tended to be people who were sick in hospital and only include symptomatic people. Since then, from places like Iceland, for example, we've seen that COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2, the virus, causes asymptomatic infection in a high proportion of people, uh, around 50%, we believe, from community surveys. So the World Health Organization originally came up with a figure mainly based on symptomatic infections calculated from the denominator of about 3.4%, which is much, much greater than comparable figures for seasonal influenza, about 0.1 to 0.5%. So that's 
deaths of one in a thousand, the WHO was claiming three in a hundred were dying from infection. Well, we have to, as in all things epidemiological, we have to think about where the numerator and the denominator are coming from. And in terms of the numerator, the deaths from the virus, it's clear that there's been some exaggeration of who dies with the virus compared to who dies from. So in a review of all the deaths in Italy, a hot spot, so a proportion of these deaths were reviewed, and about 12% of deaths were from the virus rather than with. So we see an exaggeration in the numerator which goes into the infection fatality rate. We also see that the mean age of cases, the average age of cases, is about 80 years, and that's consistent around the world, which is about the same as our average life expectancy. Only half the people in our countries make the average life expectancy. So this suggests that the infection is not actually shortening lives. Uh, we saw in modelling estimates uh, given to the New Zealand government, for example, a comparison of the number of projected deaths to be about the same as which occurred in World War I. And this is not a good comparison for many reasons. But first of all, it projects about 18,000 deaths from the virus. Currently in New Zealand, we've had 20. And also the average age of those deaths is considerably lower than what would be expected from COVID-19. The average age of deaths in World War I was 26 compared to about 80, which we are seeing through case series. Now let's also think about the denominator, the number of infections. There's a number of different ways of estimating the number of infections, and early estimates relied heavily on genetic tests, which are the standard for diagnosing SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 um, from either sputum spit, or a nose swab. From the back of the nose. And so that test only gives us a clear picture of active infection. We don't get a picture of who has seen the virus in the past. And we're starting to see studies of serological, we're starting to see serological surveys come out. Serology indicates whether you've seen the virus at some point in the past and your body has produced antibodies as a response and we're starting to see percentages of between 3 to 30 percent of individuals having some past exposure to the virus. So this makes an enormous difference when we think about the denominator in our infection fatality calculation for for COVID-19. So what does this mean? For example, in New Zealand at the moment, there's been 20 deaths, about 1,100 cases. So the infection fatality rate would be from this crude calculation about 1.7%. But if these serological tests, which have been done in the US, also similarly apply in New Zealand, for a most conservative estimate of about 3 to 5 percent, that dials back the infection fatality rate by a factor of 50, because there's 50 times more people with a serological test positive than there is people who've had a genetic PCR test and accounted as cases. So this dials back the infection fatality rate to around 0.03% or 3 in 10,000, which is much lower than for seasonal influenza. So what are our real risks of dying from infection? Well, this is a conservative estimate done by one of the world's most well-known statisticians, Professor David Spiegelhalter, 
And he noted that the infection fatality rate from numbers coming out of China, where the denominator is limited just to positive cases, is about the same as your annual mortality given your age. So we see, for example, here that 80-year-olds have an annual mortality rate of about 10%. And that corresponds to their case fatality rate from COVID-19. So it's a bit like squeezing your year's worth of risk into about two to three weeks in which you have the infection. So this puts the infection in perspective. It puts the headlines in perspective, the thousands of deaths. So what have we seen in the case series? We've seen, as we've talked about, the mean age is about the same as our life expectancy. So what does that mean? It means the virus is not shortening lives, but rather causes of death are being swapped on death certificates. We also see a high prevalence of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and cancer in the cases. And we need to consider uh, what we know about the cause of these diseases, which, uh, as I have uncovered during my career, rather than excess saturated fat, uh, excess sugar and starch intake, excess exposure to carbohydrate. So, do lockdowns work? This is a far-reaching policy which has been implemented almost all around the Western world. Uh, and there's some evidence from China, although you can see here that disease numbers were already declining before the lockdown occurred. What about in the United States? Well, the United States offers some really interesting information since some states have locked down and some haven't. Most have, about seven or eight haven't. And so I saw this article where there'd been a statistical analysis of the differences in deaths, cumulative deaths, in lockdown states versus non-lockdown states. And so I asked the author, Wilfred Riley, a college professor in Kentucky, for the data, and he kindly uh, sent, sent me it. And I built an app. So let's just have a look at that app. What does this app show? Well, here we can see that we've plotted each state's coordinates. For example, here we have Delaware, which has a population density of 854 people per square mile. And we've also plotted whether the state is under lockdown or not. And we've also got a regression plane. So we're asking ourselves, given the density and whether the state is under lockdown or not, what average numbers of COVID deaths would be predicted? And here we see New York, which has much higher rates, per capita rates of COVID deaths, 970 per million. Much, much lower are the other states in the United States. And we see from the slope of the regression plane that here we have the lockdown states, here we have the non-lockdown states, which are mostly low density. We see a very flat line. So virtually no difference between the lockdown states and the non-lockdown states in terms of their overall cases of COVID-19 deaths. What we do see is a much greater increase in COVID-19 death with population density, people per square mile. And we can try some different models, and this one tends to fit slightly better, but it shows the very similar picture that COVID-19 deaths go strongly with population density and 
a lockdown here, if anything, is having on average a negative effect on overall COVID deaths. And we see, if we just look at cases, we see a very similar picture. So that was some information that I thought was important in terms of trying to work out whether lockdown is working or not. What about New Zealand versus Australia? We know New Zealand has gone hard and gone early to contain the virus compared to Australia. Here we have cumulative cases on the vertical axis and days since lockdown on the horizontal axis. We see that New Zealand went from very low and had a rapid increase during the lockdown. In fact, it's overtaken similar population density states in New Zealand, such as Victoria. New South Wales is interesting because they had the cruise ship with many cases, so they started out at a very high rate. But the trajectory for New Zealand hasn't been better than comparable Australian states despite a harsher lockdown. So let's put this in perspective. What are the risks of dying of COVID-19 for people under 65 years? A recent study by John Ioannidis at Stanford University suggests it's about the same as driving a car between 15 and 100 kilometers each day during the pandemic. And the risk of death is 92% lower for people aged under 65 compared to the older age group. So what do I think about where we should go from here? I think we need to go back to work and school. The majority of us of working age or school age are at extremely low risk from the virus. We need to also consider the downsides of locking down. In New Zealand, we've seen 30,000 jobs lost during the lockdown. We have 100,000 people in New Zealand applying for mortgage relief. We obviously need to do our utmost to protect the vulnerable, particularly in rest homes and hospitals where our global and local experience in New Zealand is that that's where the majority of cases have come from. We need to consider, is shutting down our borders and society really worth it, given reasonably low risks posed by the virus? We also need to think about zero surveys. Another factor to think about is our metabolic health. How can we protect ourselves better by reducing uh, sugar and starch and lowering our risks posed by excess glycemia? So these are just some thoughts that I thought I'd share with you as an epidemiologist. Many people are armchair epidemiologists now that we're uh, in the midst of this pandemic. Thank you for listening.